This, this is not counseling, and I am not telling you what to do in regards to hiccups. <clears throat> Eighth chapter of John, verses 24 through 30. Ready to read? John 8, 24 through 30. Therefore, Jesus speaking, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So they were saying to him, who are you? Jesus said to them, What I have said to you from the beginning. I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus said, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. So we're going to talk about tonight the necessity of Jesus as the I am. Now, of course, you've heard me talk to you in the past about this, this uh, Old Testament name for God, taken from uh, Exodus 3.14, that's the first occurrence of that. Uh, Achaya, Achaya, I am that I am. Jesus says to Moses in Exodus 3 verse 14, as he's declaring Moses, you're my man, I'm sending you out into Egypt and you're going to deliver my people and bring them back to me at this mountain because Moses was on Sinai when this burning bush incident took place, you see. And Jesus is declaring something, uh, if there was any, any time that the Jews were going to go hell bent for murder on Jesus, it would be during this time. Now, of course, in verse 24, that's the first overt occurrence of him directly declaring himself as the I am, uh, not in a preparatory way, like I am thirsty. That's not declaring the I am, is it? But he refers to himself as the I am. And of course, in, in your Bibles, you've got the italicized word, italicized word, he, after I am. And you just scratch that out if you haven't done it already. That just shouldn't be there at all. Three times in John the 8th chapter, he makes reference to himself. In the Greek, it's ego emi. But there's no question about the fact that he's reaching back into Exodus 3, verse 14. But it's not just Exodus 3, verse 14, where he speaks about, uh, God speaks about himself being the I am, and Jesus is laying hold on the various I am passages. And we're going to look at a few of them here before I take you through these few verses right here because I really want you to feel the power and know the power of what Jesus is doing when he declares that he is the I am. Uh, he's not saying I'm representing the I am. I'm not like the I am. He is one on one I am. Because in the 10th chapter, he's going to say to another group of Jews, I and the Father are what? We've already seen uh, in John 5.18 that John says, so the Jews were trying to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath because he healed somebody on the Sabbath, God forbid, but that he also called, now this is important, he called God his Father, making himself equal with God. See, the fact that every time he called him, himself the Son of God, he was calling God his Father, obviously. And every time he said that, he was declaring equality in being, in essence, in nature, if you will, as the I am, the Egoemi, the Ahaya in Hebrew. There are a total of 23 different times, 23 different times in John's Greek text that Jesus refers to himself as the I am. Legitimately so. Not I am thirsty, not I am going, but refers to himself as the I am. I'm going to give you a few of those tonight. Not too many, though. I don't want to get us bogged down. But when, when the Hebrew word achaya is used, and God does that at the burning bush, and Jesus declares that that's me, that's me doing that, 
the very nature of the Achaya, the I am, first and foremost, uh, has to do with the one who exists, as opposed to the false gods that don't exist. So calling himself I am is all about being the one self-existent, dependent on nothing and no one, God. There's a lot of power to this. The Hebrews understood this. The Jews understood this when they heard that phrase. So Jesus is really stepping way out there. Almost, some people might say Jesus is asking for it when he declares himself as this. And he does it three times overtly here in John chapter Eight. So he's the one who exists as opposed to the false gods and anyone else that thinks he's God that does not, in fact, exist. The second idea behind this achaya in Hebrew, I am, has to do uh, with the causation. Uh, in the I am, it means all things have their cause in him. The Jews would have been thinking about this when they heard Jesus say this. Now, they didn't get it right away. But by the time we get to the end, the 58th verse of the 8th chapter, they got it and they prove that they got it and they testify that Jesus is declaring himself to be the I am by their picking up stones to stone him. So anybody that wants to say to you, Jesus never called himself God, just take them on over to John 8, 58 and 59. Show them that passage at the end of this chapter right here and ask them why then did the Jews pick up stones to stone him? It's going to happen again in, in John chapter 10. And Jesus is going to confront them about it that time. That's going to be interesting what he says there, but you're going to have to wait till we get there, obviously, for that. So it's causation within this name, the I am. All things have their cause in him. Also, within the Achaya, the I am in Hebrew, is the idea of the present and future senses of his existence. Present and future, meaning I am... I always exist, and I always will. I, ha I, I have always existed, and I always will. This is the essence of eternity. This is the essence of eternal. The, the self-existent, always existence of God, and now we are drawn into that eternity once we depart this earthly plane. That's what it means to be in eternity. So it's not about unending time. It's about any entering into the quality of existence, which is God himself. Heaven. It's not real estate. It's not addresses. It's God. It's, it's all him. It's all him extended. Creation. All the universe. The unendingness of space. That's why astronomers and and, and they can't find any end to space because there's no end to eternity. All creation extends and expresses that eternity. That is, I am. See? Lastly, there's an interesting etymological link between the Hebrew word, achaya, as is connected to yahoah. Yahoah. I am is linked to that in the Hebrew. So there's the sense in which uh, Yahoah has to do with that eternal aspect of God. And when God, when Christ rather, here in the 8th chapter, is calling himself the I am, he's making that etymological connection as well. So all of these things, I've given you like four different things that are a part of this name, I am, Achaya in Hebrew. So that when Jesus is speaking it, it is just hitting them like a sledgehammer between the eyes. And you already heard it in verse 25. They're, they're kind of like, what? Who, do you, what? who did you say you were? You know, it's that kind of a thing that's, that's coming across. Right? They, what? He didn't really say that, did he? You know, is he? Yeah, he did really say that. <clears throat> I'll have you write these down. I thought I was going to take you through them, but I'm just going to have you write them down and just kind of look at them yourself. You will notice that in the Isaiah passages, especially from Isaiah 41 uh, through 46, um, massive texts that speak about, it's, it's, it's Christ, it's the Son of Man speaking. And he's referring to himself as the I Am several times. See, uh, Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 14. Isaiah 43, verses 10 through 14. Also verse 25 of Isaiah 43. 
So Isaiah 43, 10 through 14 and verse 25. Also make a note of Isaiah 48 and verse 12. Isaiah 48 and verse 12. So actually, it's kind of a good thing. After you hear me give this teaching, then later you'll go back and look at those verses, and it'll really have more of an impact. So it's probably better that we, uh, that we do it that way. Now, in the gospel accounts, and in particular in John's gospel, since that's what we're dealing with right, right now, there are, um, there are at least one, two, three, four, four times in the gospel accounts, that G, or in the John's account, where Jesus refers to himself as the I am in the absolute sense, like he does here. Uh, in verse 24, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. See, verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. And then 58, Jesus said to them, Amen, Amen, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So you can see how these are in such an absolute sense. He's not saying, you know, I am thirsty, or I I am, even, even the bread of life, or I am the good shepherd, or, or, or I am the door. And yes, the I am is connected to those, but it's, it's like he's making a reference metaphorically to himself as the door. I'm a door. We could, we could you know, say it that way. I'm a door. <laughs> you know, I'm a shepherd. I am the good shepherd, or I'm the good shepherd, you know, contractually. Uh, but, but, but here, this is an absolute sense. Unless you believe that I am, before Abraham was born, I am. See, there's no doubt what he's saying. He's declaring himself to be the self-existing one who always will exist because he's eternal. I am the self-existing cause of all things. See, that's why Colossians 1.16 declares Jesus is the creator and has created all things by himself and for himself. See, John uh, John 1.10 says the same thing and other passages that we've looked at before. So he is the cause of all things. I always have been and I always will be. That's that present and future sense of Ahaya. All of this is slamming these Jewish folks right in the face as he is saying these things. Uh, you know, it happens again, by the way, in John 18 and verse 6. Uh, this is an absolute sense in which he calls himself the I am. And of course, <clears throat> he's in the uh, this is where the where Judas begins to betray him, and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane, excuse me. The, the crowds come up; they're going to arrest him. Um, Jesus says, "Who do you seek?" They say, "Jesus of Na the Nazarene." And he said, "I am." In verse five of chapter eighteen, "I am." And of course, they all fall back. And when he said, "I am," they drew back and fell to the ground. <laughs> That's an absolute sense. Um, in Acts twenty. Paul picks up on this and refers to Christ as God, as the I am, in Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20, verse 28, this is when he's uh, ministering his farewell and giving uh, uh, the elders at the Ephesian church um, one last good talking to and prophesying to them about the future. <clears throat> And he says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made your overseers, watch now, to shepherd the church of God, which he, God, purchased with his own blood. God purchased the church with his own blood. Not, he doesn't even say the Son of God. God purchased the church with his own blood. Paul refers to, to Jesus as God. I mean, there are, there are spots. Um, Ninth chapter of Romans and verse 5. <clears throat> Most English translations, this is hard to catch because of the way they put down uh, apostrophes. But he says, speaking about the Israelites, 9 4 and 6, adoption as sons, the glory, the covenants, giving of the law, temple services, promises, whose are the fathers, verse 5, from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God comma, blessed forever. That's where the comma goes. You've probably got a comma after the word all. Who is over all, comma, God. Just scratch that comma out. Remember, there's no punctuation in the Greek text. That ain't happening. That's not, that's not going on. This is an English understanding, and these are translators that are translating it this way. They're inserting the comma. But the Greek, and, and <laughs> the Greek is direct and in your face. He is over all God. 
That's where if you're going to put a comma, you put it after God. He's over all God, blessed forever and so on. Anyway, back in John chapter 8, as we're looking at this text and the title of the necessity of Jesus as the I am, we're going to see three things that pop out at us. First of all, he is the I am for the forgiveness of of sins. I am for the forgiveness of sins in verses 24 through 25. And then, secondly, from 26 to 27, he is the I am as judge. See, only, only the I am can be judge. It would be wrong for God the Father to ha hand all judgment over to the Son, which we've already seen him do in John chapter 5, verse 22, verse 27, unless the Son was equal with him. Otherwise, Otherwise, he's not going to be able to make the same judgment. The son's not going to be able to make the same judgment as the father unless the son is equal to the father in essence and in being and in glory. See. Thirdly, from verses 28 through 30, he's going to speak about himself as the I am who is crucified, submitted and pleasing to the father. So let's look at verse 24 under this I am for the forgiveness of of sins. And by the way, by the way, let me say this. When Jesus refers to himself as the I am in verse 24 and 28, all the way to the end of the chapter, when you get to verse 58, and he refers to himself as the I am one last time, before the scene definitely changes, and he leaves the area starting at chapter 9, verse 1, that the I am of 24 and 25 is like a bookend. And then all the way to the other end of the stack, is verse 58, which is the other bookend. These are bookends. In other words, what this is telling you here is that everything that is going on from verse 24 of chapter 8 all the way through 58 is the I am, the Achaya, the self-existing, self-existing one, eternal. I am the cause and I am causeless. Everything, everything that is going on inside of that area, bookends, right? And everything inside of this eighth chapter from verse 24 to 58 is the I am speaking. And, and they, John wants us to know that. And that's why he sets it up this way. See? So watch this. Verse 24. Therefore, I said to you, now he's still speaking to the Jews, still speaking to the same Jewish leaders, and that's going to continue all the way to the end of the chapter. Therefore, I said to you that you, all of you, plural, plural will die in your sins. See, that's why he says to them, <clears throat> verse 21, I go away and you will seek me and will die in your sin for where I am going, you cannot come. Because they're going to die in their sins. So 24, I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, we just touched on this a couple weeks ago, but this really speaks to the necessity of understanding that Jesus is equal with God the Father. Now, this is what messes with our, 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 you know, our limited human minds and everything like that. It's hard for us to conceive how three personalities could be one, and yet, and yet clearly Jesus claims, the, the Jesus that you claim to believe in, right? he claims in chapter 10, verse 31, that he and the Father are one. He claims in John 17 when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying. And he says, restore unto me, Father, the glory I had with you, with you, with you before the world was. So you've either got, you've either got a lunatic on your hands and you're all deceived and I'm the arch deceiver because I'm pushing it at you. Or he really is that. He really is the I am. See, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't require sleepless nights. It's just one or the other. Okay. So the I am here. Uh, you must believe that he is I am or you will die in your sins. Therefore, anybody that does not believe that the historical Jesus of Nazareth is 100% God in human form cannot be saved. You can, quote, believe on Jesus, quote, accept Jesus into your heart. You can do all that stuff. But if you have a Christology that allows for a Jesus to just be this envoy, this ambassador sent from God. But is he God? If your answer is, well, no, well, then you can say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus all the day long, and you're still going to die in your sins. It doesn't work that way. The content of the Savior, the personhood of the Savior, is what makes effectual the work of the cross. It's the personhood of the Savior. 
He has to be what we refer to theologically as the second person of the Godhead. And really, the Godhead is not one, two, three. It's not the Father in first place, the Son is just a squeak down, just along the next step, you know, second place. It's not a stairway. Kind of, they're equal. It's just the way they've been revealed to us. See, that's all. It's the way the scriptures opens that up to us. It's very slow throughout the Old Testament, and then it kicks it in the gas and picks up speed when we get uh, into the New Testament documents, especially with the teaching of, of Jesus himself, and then on to the Apostle Paul and the rest of the apostles. So that's an absolute necessity. Verse 25, wow, what a thing to say to these Jewish leaders. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. It's verse 25, so they were saying to him, uh, who, who, who are you? Who, who did he say he was? That's the way I'm taking this. That's the way I read it in Greek. Who, who are you? <laughs> who did he say he was? And so Jesus says to them. Now my New American Standard says this, bottom of 25. What have I been saying to you from the beginning? Question mark. Um, there is a real discussion. If you open up critical Greek commentaries on, on this passage in John right here, there's an ongoing discussion amongst a lot of Greek scholars as to which way this phrase in the Greek text needs to be, needs to be interpreted. Um, uh, a lot of people do not come out down on the side of making it a question. The, the, uh, the translating committee for the New American Standard felt that it, this was an interrogative. Okay? I, I think they're mistaken about that. And uh, I, would, I would recommend that you scratch out that question mark if you've got one there at the end, because it's not an interrogative. The Greek, uh, my translation is this. Instead of uh, when uh, they ask him, who are you? Jesus says to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? You know, it's almost like, you know, he's calling them to accountability with that question. Well, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? But, uh, you know, I could, I could get some mileage out of that preaching-wise, but that's not really what the, the Greek reads, in my opinion. In my opinion, the Greek text should read, What I have said to you from the beginning. You might want to write that down. What I have said to you from the beginning. I'll give it to you one more time. What I have said to you from the beginning. That's, it, it is admittedly tough to get this across uh, from Greek into English. And I'm not going to give you the details right now in regards to that. I'm not going to talk to you about, you know, the, the fact that we have, you know, the word saying right here, which is let go. What have I been saying to you? It's let go. And they, they're rendering it in a participle English ending, but it is not uh, a participle mood, you know, in Greek. And it, it's just touchy here in regards to this. But uh, I really think he's reflecting back to what, he said to them, who is the them? And, yeah, let's just go with the Jews right now. The Pharisees, of course, are in this. Earlier in chapter 8, we do have the Pharisees. All right, the Pharisees are still there. Then John begins to refer to the same group. Remember, nothing has changed here. They haven't left. It's not a different group. And he starts calling them the Jews, the Jews, the Jews. Even when we get to the end of our text tonight, he's going to refer to the Jews who believed on him and it's going to be very, we'll pick up on that next week, but it's going to be very interesting because these Jews who believe on him are going to blaspheme him in a matter of a few verses. How could they believe on him? We'll tackle that mostly next week, okay? So we've got the same people. So he says to them, after they say, who, who are you? And Jesus says, what? Not who I have been saying from the beginning, because the what here is tis in Greek, and it's neuter and gender. And that's important. That's why I, we say what it's as opposed to who, okay? So who are you? And Jesus says, what I have been saying to you from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning, from the beginning. What do we do with that? Well, we could go all the way back to the beginning in Genesis 1-1, but I don't think that's what Jesus is referring to because he says what I have been saying, who I am, is what I have been saying to who? Yeah, yeah, the Jews, the group he's talking to right then, okay? I don't even think we need to go all the way back to John, the first chapter. I don't think we need to be doing that either. I think he's talking to them. Like he says, what I have been saying to all of you, it's that plural again, all of you from the beginning. From the beginning of what? Well, from the beginning of this particular discussion. 
And this particular discussion with these particular people begins in chapter 8 and verse, somebody tell me. What do you think? Both you and Mary said the same thing. That's pretty good. Keep going back further. 12. That's right. It's 12. It's 12. Look at verse 12. Then Jesus, once again, or furthermore, spoke to them, it's the same group, Jews, saying what? I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness. And so, in verse 24, he says, unless you believe that I am, you're going to die in your sins. And they say, who are you? And he says, what I have said to you from the beginning. What I've been saying to you all along since we've been starting this speech. What did he just say in 24? Unless you believe that I am. What was I saying to you from the beginning? Well, verse 12, it's the beginning of the conversation. He says, Jesus spoke to them, I am the light of the world. That's what he's been saying from the beginning. And so the I am and the necessity of Jesus being the I am for forgiveness of sins is absolutely critical. And that's, it's a little tough for our minds, you know, to grab hold of. Um, just apprehend it. This is the exegesis of the text from the Old Testament into the New Testament. That the Lord Jesus Christ became man and God the Father is spirit. And he is not static. He's omnipresent. Jesus of Nazareth in his human body, even in his raised glorified body, is not omnipresent. His body is in a location at a time. His Holy Spirit, which 2 Corinthians 3.17 says is the spirit of Jesus, and yet all three of them evidence uh, separate personalities, and yet all three of them have the exact same mind and are working towards the same goals, you see. So they are one, but they express themselves. The Godhead is one, but it expresses itself tri-personally. Tri-personally. So Jesus is Ahaya. He is the I Am, and you have to receive that and know that in order to have your sins forgiven. Otherwise, it isn't happening. That brings us to the second point. And this is the I am as judge, verse 26. So he says directly to them after they said, who are you? And I said, and he says, well, what I've, been, what I've said to you from the beginning, verse 12, right? And now he says in 26, I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. Isn't that interesting? They say, who, do you, who are you? He just said, I'm the I am. I am Achaya. I, I am the, the Exodus 3.14. I am the God who met with Moses. That's who I am. The eternally self-existent cause without cause approach to me one. I am causeless. I am the one doing the cause. And this one who, who is the self-existent, eternal cause, causation one, says I have many things to speak to you. We'll come back to that. I have many things to speak and to next judge concerning you. Because what did we see in 522? It's a good time to look at it. In 522, Jesus says, For not even the Father judges anyone. Why? But he has given all judgment to the Son. Down to 27. And he, the Father, gave him, Christ, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. See that? Son of Man. Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus ascends to the Father. The, the angelic hosts bring him to the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days grants unto him a kingdom and a dominion that never goes away, that is eternal, that goes on and on. And he calls himself the Son of Man. Well, of course he's the judge. He's the ultimate judge. When, when, they, when the two women, the two prostitutes, brought the one baby before King Solomon, you remember this whole thing? One of them rolled over on their child in the middle of the night, smothered it, and, you know, Solomon says what? They were coming to him for, for judgment. Yeah, he says, Let's, I know what to do. Bring me a sword. Cut him in half. And so the real mother says, no, no, no. She wants the child to live. Solomon says, ah, that's the real mother. Give her to Well, they brought... They brought 
that decision to the king. He made a judgment. Jesus is the exact same way. He's the king. He's the judge. So right now we're studying this coming Sunday. We'll be in part two, you know, of this, uh, this perspective on our payday relative to the Bema Seat judgment. Remember in 1 Corinthians 3, we'll be wrapping that up uh, this Sunday, Lord willing. Jesus is, it's the Bema Seat of Christ, it says. But he's the ultimate judge. The Father isn't judging anyone. We just read it. 522. The Father judges no one. The Father's judging no one. There shouldn't be any, any weirdness about this. There shouldn't be any confusion about this. Jesus is the judge. So at the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, it's Jesus that is sitting on the great white throne. He is the Ahaya. He is the Egoemi. He is the I Am. God the Father has given him all authority to judge because he's the Son of Man, vis-a-vis -vis Daniel 7, 13, and 14. The Father judges no one. And the Father is absolutely glorified through Christ Jesus. Ah, uh, gosh, we saw it in Acts 10.42. That's a hot one to look at. In Acts 10.42, Peter's preaching, and he says in Acts 10.42, and he, meaning God, ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one, speaking of Christ, who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. And the living is the Bema Seat judgment. Those who are alive go to the Bema Seat judgment. They're alive in Christ. Those who are dead, spiritually speaking, they go to the great white throne. And they're judged according to their works. And every one of them go into the lake of fire. How about Acts 17 and verse 31? Acts 17 and verse 31. Paul's preaching to the pagans on Mars Hill. And in Acts 17, verse 31, speaking of Christ, it says, Because he, God, has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Who did he raise from the dead? Christ. Yeah. Raised him. And he is the judge. He is the overcoming son of man. He is the judge of the Acts 10.42 living, those are believers, and the dead, unbelievers, the unregenerate people. I just, I just, I don't know why that gets to me like it does. I, I don't know. Back to John chapter 8. And so I have many things, verse 26, to speak and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true. Uh, that's important because of what he's about to say next. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. What he hears from him is true. Middle of 26, but he, God who sent me, is true. The things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. So, so this is great. This is right along the same lines as what we saw earlier in regards to uh, the works of healing. We started seeing it in John chapter 5, that when Jesus sees the Father do something, he mirrors it exactly. So he sees the Father multiplying the loaves and the fishes. He sees the Father uh, healing the blind man. He sees uh, the Father uh, going in, in, uh, in John chapter 4 and touch, or 5, excuse me, earlier in 5, and touching that man who for 38 years was at the pool of Bethesda and just weak and sickly. He sees the Father doing this. He he sees the Father commanding Satan to get behind me. He sees the Father casting out demons. So Jesus does exactly what he sees. See, he mirrors it. And so now, now Jesus says, I hear from him. And you know what we do with people who hear voices. Or think about people who hear voices. But the intimacy between the Father and the Son is such. See, there's no Adamic fallenness here. There's no sin nature here. And so it is crystal clear reception, immediate, all the time. And so I hear from him. And the things that I hear from him, I speak to the world. So whatever Jesus has to say is direct from the Father, isn't it? Whatever the Apostle Paul has to say is direct from Jesus, which is direct from the Father. And here's, that's the way it works primarily in the New Testament. It's God the Father who speaks to the Son. 
The Son then delivers that to us. Then the Apostle Paul is raised up. And Jesus clarifies and gives further information that, he, that was not given in the Old or the New Testament in addition to what was given there and speaks through the Apostle Paul. The other Apostles, please understand me, I'm not saying they're not inspired, those who are writing, they are. But only Paul is the one who says, follow me as I follow Christ. Only Paul is the one that tells Timothy that. Only Paul is the one who says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 14, I think it's verse 37, that you, he says, you guys who think you're spiritual, if any man among you is spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things I write for, to you are from God. See? And Jesus raised him up, says uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to him on the Damascus Road and, and to, uh, uh, I forgot the guy's name. Uh, Ananias, thank you. It says to Ananias, see, feet of clay, check it out. It says to Ananias, knock it off, Ananias. He is a chosen vessel of mine. Listen to that. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to the Gentiles. Well, I thought he already had chosen vessels out there. I thought he already had Peter out there. I thought he already had the 11 out there, didn't he? Why did he need Paul? This was a chosen vessel. This is a special occasion. I'm doing something special through him, something special. You got like 13 of the epistles in the New Testament that are written by that guy. Do you think that's chance? Does he just have like a big mouth and he's just got to get glory hog attention to himself? Is that the Apostle Paul? No, I got to write more. I've got to publish more books. Got to... Is that what he wants? He just wants the attention? No, the Holy Spirit is doing this through him. Follow me as I follow Christ. And so, these things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. At the bottom of 26, I'd write, Bottom of 26, I'd write verse 28b. Verse 28b. Watch how he keeps coming back to this idea. I hear from God. I hear from God. 28b. But I speak these things as the Father taught me. I speak these things as the Father taught me. Right at the end of 28, write verse 40. Verse 40. Jesus speaking to the Jews, but as it is, you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, which I heard from God. That's three times to the same group of people in a short amount of time. He's affirming something. The word from God comes through Christ all the time, consistently. Then it flows through the Apostle Paul. And the other men have their place. Their stuff is just as inspired, but none of them have this directive. And this choosing, special choosing and anointing by the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, these things which I heard from him, bottom of 26, these I speak to the world, 27. <laughs> they did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. Well, now, wait a minute. Top of, uh, at 26, he says, unless you believe that I am a go me, you're going to die in your sins. They say, uh, what? Who are you? And he says, what I've been saying to you from the beginning, the beginning of this conversation, verse 12. And he says, I am the light of the world. What have I been saying to you from the beginning? The words that I speak, I get directly from God, 27. They didn't realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. What were they thinking that he was getting? Who, who, who do you think he was speaking about? When he says at the bottom of 26, but he who sent me is true. That's not the first time Jesus talked about being sent from the Father. What's their problem? These things which I heard from him. These I speak to the world. They didn't realize that he had been speaking to them of the Father. How do you reach this level of spiritual dense? Well, first, you've got a special situation with these Jewish leaders that he's talking to here. We're, not, we're talking about not only born dead in trespasses and sins and the, in the ink black death the no spiritual reception uh, of the fallenness of the Adamic nature. But we're talking about men who, according to Jesus in the Gospels, especially if you get on over to the 23rd chapter of Matthew, we're talking about men that took the Adamic fallen nature and added to it and built on it and ingratiated and, uh, themselves to this fallen nature all in the name of the Lord Jesus. 
they called him Yahuwah. But Jesus has already made it clear that he is that. Uh, you read Matthew 23, and Jesus starts talking about scribes, Pharisees, and these are all members of the Sanhedrin. Scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. You got this nice whitewash room, right? You make it all look good outside, but inside you're full of stinking, rotten, dead men's bones. Hypocrites. Oh, yeah. You make long, lofty prayers for the poor widow because she has nothing now. But you're the ones who have taken their homes directly from them. Thieves, these men were, using their religious privilege and pedigree to rule over these people in the way that they did. There is no, no group of people more black-hearted in sin in the New Testament than the Jewish leaders and members of the Sanhedrin. There is none. They are the ones who are the most escoriated by Christ in particular. And then Peter, after the day of Pentecost, man, the Holy Spirit gave him a backbone like an iron fence, man. And he says, you crucified him. Remember, that was his theme for many chapters at the beginning of Acts. You crucified. God raised him from the dead. See, God overdid, overturned what you tried to do. Verse 27 here says, they didn't realize he'd been speaking to them about the Father. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, maybe it's found in verse 42. Verse 42. Jesus said to them, same group, if God were your Father, you would love me. Did they love Jesus? No, 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 no. So they, they didn't have God as their Father, did they? So anybody that doesn't love Jesus doesn't have God the Father. Isn't that true? Let's hear it a good hearty amen. Amen. Yeah. He says, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth have come from God. I have not even come on my own initiative. He sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It's because you can't hear, I would say, it's a kuo again, understand. You don't understand what I'm saying because you don't understand my word. And that's why Jesus was constantly saying to these guys, you especially see it in Matthew and Mark in particular, have you not read? How come you guys can't read? Do you not understand what was written? Have you never read? Right? Does it not say in your law? I can just see him. I hope you don't see Jesus sitting up there all nice and with a nice chiseled Greek nose, you know, a nice flowing beautiful, well-oiled locks, you know, and his little roby thing, different colors because, you know, he's color coordinated, you know, and, and he's sitting on the rock and he's, you know, he's like, do you not read? You've got to do this. Do you not, you know, ah. it's like, don't you read? Can't you understand? Look what he's saying right here. You don't understand what I'm saying because you cannot understand my word. And here's why. Here's why they didn't understand he was talking to them about the father. Verse 44. You're of your father who? The devil. And you want to do his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. What's he saying? If you want to do his desires and he was a murderer from the beginning, you want to murder too. You guys are murderers. He's really. You're going to flip when you, when you find out pretty soon here who these people are. <laughs> he was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand to the truth. There's no truth in him. All right. If they're of their father the devil, there is no truth in him. In the, in the devil, then Jesus is saying what? There's no truth in you. You got no truth. You're of your father the devil. You're murderers. You can't understand my word. And these guys, they were all decked out in, in all of their Pharisaical and Sadducee and Jewish uh, outfits. Man, they had their, they had, they had the, 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 I'm forgetting what. Phylacteries. phylacteries, thank you. The tzitzit tied around their heads, you know, and they had the little passages of scripture and they have the leather armband go all the way around their arm and they have the little teat teat another phylactery tied on there and in their little box or little scriptures you know they're writing their stuff they're writing God's name on their doorposts you know and they got these long flowing robes Jesus chomped on them by that he says man those guys like to have those robes as long and as flowing as they can because it made them look like they were more spiritual and the Jew average Jewish man would have the little blue tassels attached to the bottom of his robe it reminded him of the, the law of Moses these guys elongated them they're just whoa Oh, way out there because they're, they're just super spiritual see they haven't got it inside so they've got to turn up crank up the amplification and get up the, the technicolor so it looks like they've got it and then everybody bows down why don't you understand when he speaks he speaks a lie 
44 says. He speaks of his own nature. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. So they're liars too. Ah, okay. So back to 27. They didn't realize that he had been speaking to them about the father, and that's why, I think. Which leads us to the third and final point, and this is the I am crucified, submitted and pleasing to the Father. Look at 28. So Jesus said, when you, all of you, lift up the Son of Man, Daniel 7, 13 and 14, he's just shoving it in their faces. Son of Man, Son of Man. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that, what? I am. Second time he's put it in their face. The first time he says it, and then it's like, who, who do you say you are? And he says, it's just who I said to you from the beginning, verse 12. I am the light of the world. This should be nothing to you. Many things to speak and judge concerning you. But you sent me as true, things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. I don't, they didn't realize he'd been speaking to them about the Father. Well, that's because they're of their father, the devil. And the devil's desires they want to do. They want to kill him, and they want to kill anybody else that gets in their way. They have no truth in them because the devil has no truth in them. They can't speak the truth because the devil speaks lies. And so they can't speak the truth because they speak lies because they're following their father, the devil. And so Jesus hits them now with the second I am. Jesus said, when you lift up the Son of Man, Jesus, there's a couple things happening here. Number one, he's pointing his finger at them, and he's saying, I know it's going to be you that's going to do it. It's going to be you, you Jewish leaders. Can you see them in your mind's eye, all decked out? Can you see them just shaking? They're getting it. They're starting to get this. He's calling himself the I am. He's the, he's the cause without cause. He's the self-existent one. He's the creator. Uh, he is past, present, and future. He's eternal. He says he's the I am, the Achaya. And you're going to kill me, he says in 28. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. Of course, chapter 3, verse 14 is a great place to go for this lifting up idea. Chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that the one who believes in him will have eternal life. This lifting up that's going on happens again in chapter 12, verse 32 and 33. Chapter 12, verse 32 and 33. Jesus says, If I am lifted up, will draw from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And then this is important. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. So lifting up is the cross, the kind of death. And so it makes it clear, you go back to 828, Jesus says, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Really? These guys are going to know that Jesus is the I am at the crucifixion when he is lifted up. Let me show you how that happened. <laughs> Matthew 27. Sold your spot here and go to Matthew 27. Look at verse 33. Matthew 27, verse 33. And I recommend, well, it's up to you. You can put it in your notes. You can write it in your margin of your Bibles. I'm going to show you how they were supposed to know that Jesus is the I am at the crucifixion. Matthew 27, starting at verse 33. And when they came to a place called Gagatha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. After tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. That's messianic, and that comes from Psalm 69 and verse 21. Psalm 69 and verse 21, fulfilling that passage. But there's more. 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among them by casting lots. That's Psalm 22 and verse 18. For my raiment, my clothing, they have cast lots. Psalm 22, 18. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And these, of course, are the Roman soldiers. And above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of of the Jews. That, of course, was authored by Pontius Pilate. And it's an open declaration in three languages, we're told, in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. 
so that everybody, because Jerusalem was a cosmopolitan city, so everybody, and Golgotha was, was uh, near the main highway on the road leading into Jerusalem, and everybody coming in could see who this was. And of course, this is Pilate shot at the Jews. You know, he hated the Jews. And this is his, you know, his deprecation in regards to them. But it's a declaration. This is Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, the Nazarene. Of course, the people are going, oh, can anything good come from Nazareth? But it's the Nazar. It's the, it's the branch. See, and every Jew would know about the Zechariah prophesies, prophesying. They would know about the Isaiah prophesying, the Jeremiah prophesying, about the branch. Well, this is Jesus, the branch. He's king of the Jews. Well, only God gets that declaration, ladies and gentlemen. Only God gets that declaration as being king of the Jews. And then there's the two robbers who were crucified him, crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. Well, just make a note of Isaiah 53, verse 9 right there. Isaiah 53 and verse 9, right next to that verse. It says, I'm going to read it to you so I don't goof it up. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Right in the middle of this, of this Isaiah 53, which is all about his twofold propitiation, substitution for sin, Substitution for sickness and disease. Verse 8 says that Jesus was cut off of the land of the living. Karat, he suffered the death penalty. For the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, his grave was assigned with wicked men. Back in Matthew 27, it says, And those passing by, actually, let me have you Go ahead, since we're at Isaiah 53, and in Matthew 27, verse 57, 57, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. You know this, he goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. He, get, he is granted it. Joseph took the body, 55, 59, wrapped it in clean cloth, 60, laid it in his own new tomb. What does 57 say Joseph of Arimathea was? Rich man, and Jesus' body goes in the rich man's tomb. What does Isaiah 53, 9 say? His grave was assigned with wicked men, the two on the cross, yet he was with a rich man in his death. What did Jesus say in John chapter 8? When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Did they know all of this? Back to Matthew 27. Verse 39, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads, saying, you are going to destroy the temple, rebuild in three days, save yourself. Well, Psalm 22, verse 7 says, verse 39, almost verbatim. Psalm 22, verse 7 goes next to verse 39. And then look down at 41. In the same way, the chief priests, also along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him, saying, this is amazing. He saved others. He can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. They're being mocking, of course. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. No, they wouldn't. Now watch 43. The, who's saying this? The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. It's members of the Sanhedrin. 50, 43. He trusts in God. Let, him, let God rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. Two things. That's Psalm 22 and verse 8 verbatim. And it's in the mouths of these foul, wicked Jews. <laughs> the second thing here in 23 is they confess Jesus as saying that he was the Son of God. For he said, meaning Jesus said, I am the Son of God. See, they, they had the witness. They knew it. But the blackness of their souls was impenetrable. 46, about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's easy. Where's that from? Yeah, Psalm 22, 1, baby. And so in John 8... <laughs> Jesus says, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. Verse 28 of John 8, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. 
See, he's in total submission. See, the I am crucified, lift it up, submitted, and now something else, pleasing to the Father, 29. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, but he will. But he will. On the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He has to. Because the Son becomes, at that moment, he takes on and becomes soaked with all of the sin of all of the elect for all time in order to satisfy God's righteous requirement. And he takes it into himself. First Peter 2.24 says, that he takes our sin into himself. And the Father has to turn away. Because the Father is too holy to look on that which is unholy. He cannot look on. That's why wrath comes. It's not because he's, he's mad. That's an anthropomorphism. To just give us some kind of understanding because we're pea-brained. But it's because of his holiness. See? So people who think that they can get in front of God, that they can go before him uh, without being washed in the blood of the Lamb, are just asking for wrath. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. I don't know about you. We're, we're pretty much done, but I, I have that underlined, and, and I just keep going back to that from time to time in my life. Kelly, do you always do the things that are pleasing to him? I don't get myself all bound up with that. It's just a reminder of who call, Christ has called me to be so that my flesh, my physical and mental and emotional weaknesses do not take hold in my life. Do I always do those things that please the Father? I'm a new creation. I can do the things that are pleasing the Father. Why? Because Christ's righteousness is imputed to me. There's no barrier between me and the Father. There's no barrier between me pleasing the Father. I, I can do that. Because I do it through Christ. He pleases the Father. And the Father is pleased with me, and he is pleased with you, because he's pleased with his Son. It's not by what you do. It can never be by what you do. Christ did not save you to make, a better, to make you a better law keeper. Or to make you just morally superior. Or his little shining, you know, example of what a good little boy and a good little girl are to be. <laughs> because you can't do it. How many people have tried to keep all of the laws? Uh, I, I never have. Uh, I'm sure I would have been well on my way to it had I not realized, you know, Galatians 3, 10 through 12, that I got to keep them all and I got to keep them perfectly and I already knew I couldn't do that. Doism. See, everybody that goes to the, lake, goes to the great white throne, throne judgment is judged based on that. Their works are compared to all of God's laws, and they have to, their works must match up perfectly with all over 600 of God's laws. Or they go into the lake of fire, and everybody goes into the lake of fire. And guess what? God already knows this. That's why he didn't write their names in the Lamb Book of Life. They are vessels of wrath. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. So do I. Because I recognize that Christ is the one who pleases God. And I am in Christ. The old things have passed away, 2 Corinthians 5.17. All things have become new. And Christ is pleased with me. Get, get this, folks. Christ is pleased with me. The Father is pleased with me because he's pleased with his Son. And I'm in his Son. That's how that works. Now, you know what? The natural man goes, oh, gosh, that's way too easy. Are you kidding me? That ain't, what? That ain't, that ain't working. No, that's not going to work for me. That's entirely too easy. Merit, merit. Merit and us former, not us, but you guys, some of you are former Roman Catholics, you know about the treasury of merit. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> treasury of merit? Verse 30. And as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Isn't that a nice, that a nice and fuzzy feeling at the end right there? Many came to believe in him. Oh, good. Yeah, just the, just the power of Christ's words, you know. Many came to believe in him. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, many came to believe in him. Preview for next week. Ready? 31. 
So Jesus was saying to those Jews who believed in him. Underscore the word Jew right there. Right next to that, I'll get you ready for next week. Right next to that, right, verse 48. 48. Look at verse 48. The Jews answered and said to him. Now, underscore that. 48 says the Jews. Underscore the Jews right there in 48. Right, verse 52, right next to that. Verse 52. Look down to 52. The Jews said to him. Underscore the Jews right there. Right next to that. Right, 57, verse 57. With me? Then look at 57. So the Jews said to him, why am I doing this? I want you to see that John is providing a crystal clear, consistent reference to who it is that supposedly is believing in him from what he said. Because I want you to see what kind of belief this is. It's not a salvific belief. Because as we go through the rest of this chapter, you're going to see these exact same Jews who believed in him, call him a liar, commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit by saying he's demon-possessed, not once, but twice. And those same Jews who believed in him, in verse 59, will pick up stones to kill him. It's the same Jews that, who believed in him that Jesus is going to say in 44, you're of your father the devil. So what is this verse 30? What is this belief all about? He spoke these things. Many came to believe in him. Well, well, well that could have, that's the many in the crowd. It's some, da, 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 verse 31 tells us who the many are. So Jesus was, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him. Very clear. That just tells us, folks, once again, that John is very interested in exploding this idea and making clear that a lot of people say they believe in Jesus, but it's not a salvific belief, is it? So here's what I want to have you do, and we're done. At the bottom of verse 30, write down chapter 2, verse 23 through 25. Chapter 2, 23, 25. That's the linchpin that John keeps coming back to. He's saying there's plenty of people out there who say they believe on Jesus and they hang around with him, they go with him for a while, and then he says or does something that ticks them off and away they go. Lots of folks believe in Jesus in the manger as a little baby as we just had displayed for us throughout all the media and all of the decorations in the home and all that business and the stuff outside and all that stuff. People have no problem believing in, oh, yeah, oh, oh, holy night, the stars, the stars are shining. Got no problem, love that, love that stuff. Oh, eight, eight tiny reindeer going through this. I got no problem with eight tiny reindeer. I have everything with the other stuff. People like that. A little baby in there, there in the manger, fabulous. What great story. Mm hmm but it's the same little baby who started telling the religious leaders of his day, you're of your father the devil. It's the same little baby who said, I and the father are one. It's the same little baby who said, if you don't believe that I am a go and me, you're going to die in your sins. Well, now he's not a cute little baby anymore. Now he's a psychological wreck. Now he's just trying to amass people to himself. What a shame. Oh, aren't you glad, Mary, that Joseph isn't alive anymore to have to see this, you know, and what a shame. Just put it in perspective for you. Lots of people believe on him when it's convenient. When they can make Jesus into their own image of who they want God to be, that's how they believe on him. The one who believes because they have been given the gift of faith, they've been had their sin nature removed, they're a new creation in Christ, the old has passed away. There's a difference. There's a major difference. That's why the apostles, and John in particular, and 1 John, keep coming back to, listen, if somebody continues in sin, 1 John 3, 6, and 9, continues in sin and lives that way, present tense form of the verb, armatia, and keeps sinning regularly, continuously, habitually, they haven't seen God, they don't know God. And the word of God is not in them, and the word hasn't changed them. It's simple. It's real simple. 
Now, the, once again, I have to be clear, we're not talking about Christians who are new creations in Christ, who are just fighting. They, they don't want that old habit to have ascendancy. I know brothers and sisters, and so do you. Maybe some of you are the same way. You're struggling, and you're str you may be struggling for years. Gotcha. I hear you. Been there. I know what you mean. You're still regenerate. The struggle proves it. <laughs> Otherwise, you just succumb to it. It's easier that way. But you won't, you won't succumb to it. You won't keep doing it. You know it's wrong. It's frustrating to you. You want it to stop. That's a good thing. But, but by the way, there is a time to stop. And, and, and it can happen now. It, the Holy Spirit just give you that illumination. Romans 6, 6. I am telling you, that is the silver bullet, ladies and gentlemen. That is it. Crucified with Christ. Your sin nature, just, just the knowledge that the sin nature has been removed is clarifying in this area. You can't be a Christian and have a sin nature. It, that's counteractive, counterproductive. It's contra scripture, it's contra Paul. Okay, I said I was going to stop and I, I didn't. So I repent of lying to my congregation. Thank you, Lord, for providing this evening for us to gather together and just drink deep. At the fountain of your truth, O oh God, cause your people, Lord, to just be built up now with these things. Thank you that you take us further on and, and illuminate for us, Lord, the depth, Lord, as much as we can take in as fallible creatures that uh, we might mind the depths of what the I am means in Jesus as the I am. Just help us to see this and help us to take this, Lord, and teach this to somebody else. Thank you, Lord, for providing uh, food for the soul and comfort, healing for the body and the mind. Thank you for hearing our prayer requests tonight, Lord, all the people we've lifted up to you. We know, Lord, that you're faithful and you're going to do as we have asked for these people. Thank you for all these things tonight. Bless your people, Lord, as they go home. Give them wonderful sleep. You've given your angels charge concerning us as we drive home. Thank you for these things, O oh Lord God. Bring us all together now, Lord God, next this coming Sunday, so that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus, amen.